Straits Times exclusive, two men speak out about losing their wives to an alleged spiritual leader whom we're calling Ali. What he believes is he's the, the prophet, so he also wanted the same attributes as the actual prophet. More frequent flying from next month, Singapore Airlines expects to operate 16% of its pre-COVID-19 capacity. And for the first time, you can get inside the clock tower at the Victoria Theatre and Concert Hall. Hello, welcome to The Big Story, coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Kuei. And I'm Harianto Diman, and you can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Let's begin with a Straits Times exclusive. For the last 15 years, an alleged Malay Muslim religious sect has existed in the vicinity of Arab Street. Senior correspondent Zaihat Muhammad Yusuf spent the last two months investigating the group's leader and his female followers who are regarded as his spiritual wives. Now here's more on Zaihan's exclusive story. The leader of the religious sect known as Ali is a former massage therapist in his mid-50s. He has five spiritual wives at present who help him run a small restaurant and an events business. Each night, religious classes begin when the restaurant closes at 8pm and can last till 2am. During the classes, Ali would be possessed by a spirit who talks to the group. But he told us he can actually call our last prophet to, to be with him, as in, as in to, to, mm. to be you know, present in him. Yeah, spirit, spirit okay. in spirit. So, so he did call uh, our last prophet and then uh, in a very weird uh, accent and then he revealed himself as the last prophet. His teachings include using proceeds from gambling to help needy Muslims. Gambling goes against Islamic teachings. Some of his spiritual wives were married before, but left their husbands to be with Ali. These women include a former CEO of a local Malay Muslim organization, as well as a junior college lecturer. One of the ex-husbands, Mr. Muhammad, discovered meeting minutes and handwritten notes that his wife had taken during religious classes. When I saw the notes, uh, physically my, my hands are trembled. My heart, is, uh, is, as I'm talking right now, is pulsating. The notes say that she wants to leave me to join him. As one of his ST also acquired handwritten notes and emails dating back to 2009, as well as the group's 90 page religious manual. Among its teachings, Ali claims to be the Prophet Muhammad, who is allowed to have 13 wives. When ST approached Ali, he denied any involvement with the group and refuted claims that he has spiritual wives. Checks with religious authorities here show his name is not listed on the Asatiza Recognition Scheme, a database of certified religious teachers. Mr. Mohammed believes that exposing the group will serve as a warning to the Malay Muslim community. Now, the story goes much deeper than that, and who better to share more about it than Zaihan Muhammad Yusuf, the Straits Times senior correspondent who did all the legwork for this. Hi, Zaihan. Zaihan, this man is known to uh, the authorities here. He was the subject of a police investigation back in 2015. Now, what made you choose to further pursue this man and his story, and what were you hoping to achieve through this story? Well, uh, Yan, in the beginning when I was told about this rumour in sometime in uh, middle of March, I thought it was nonsense. Uh, it couldn't be true, not, especially not in this day and age. But um, as I got closer and deeper into the story, I realised that there might be some truth in it. And I got worried after I met uh, four of the men, uh, basically three of the men, uh, one of them has since passed on, whose wives left them to be with this uh, spiritual leader. Now, can you imagine um, the families that have broken up, shattered lives and so on? So I thought there was a point where we needed to tell this story, no matter how uh, bitter, how unpleasant, how uncomfortable, we need to warn others about this man and his group and their activities. In piecing together this story, could you talk us through the investigative work that you had to put into it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Actually, um, when I started, I heard the rumor in uh, mid-March. The problem was it was about the same time as COVID. So I couldn't do anything until about maybe after the elections. That's when I went full on. The problem was I had to convince the husbands to speak to me. They were reluctant. I mean, maybe for obvious reasons, because it's embarrassing. Uh, they don't want to relive again what they went through, the divorce. There were four divorces here. And um, so I had to piece together uh, who were the players. Uh, and it helped me a lot when I received documents uh, about maybe 200 to 300 pages of uh, meeting notes, uh, meeting minutes, class notes, religious class notes, uh, WhatsApp exchanges and emails from uh, group members to people that they were trying to convince to stay with the group. Mm. So it was a long time. And um, fortunately, the husbands agreed to share with me their story. You know, some of them had been followers of the group. Others, they were just shocked when they found out that uh, what the wives were up, were up to. So um, with that settled around September to October, I watched this group for about a month every night and just to, 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 to see whether there is a pattern and where, where they went to. Uh, they usually went out together, you know, mm. like all six, uh, you know, and, and um, that man will always go back with a different woman. Uh, he's driven to his home, sent back home. And, and all I can tell is that this is a tight group. It makes you wonder what what is this man's lure? What what is this yeah. attraction? You know, there is a picture of you and this man, uh, you know, facing each other, and I assume you guys exchanged a few words. So could you get a sense of you know, like you said, this man's allure, yes, and also yes. the personalities of you know uh, the the five spiritual wives. Okay, even um, you know, I've spoken to the some of the wives, and I've spoken to. Uh, his enemies, those who despise him, they all agree. This guy is a very gentle person. You know, there's a Malay saying, pijak semut tak mati. You, he, he's like a person who steps on an end and then the end will not die. He's so gentle. That's what they claim. Now, when I confronted him on uh, October 25th, he was surprised that, uh, I mean, he wasn't expecting me, of course. Uh, well, I asked him whether he was A, a spiritual leader of this group, B, uh, whether he has many spiritual wives and see whether he is the prophet. He denied everything. But the manner in which he told me, the, the manner in which he denied those allegations, it was just too cool. But I could see, uh, you know, he had his mask on. I could see from his eyes that uh, showed a bit of defiance because, you know, he was cool, but he was upset that maybe perhaps someone had found out about his little secret. Mm, right. Uh, Zai, so what now? You know, you told us that uh, you've been uh, getting a lot of responses uh, ever since your story uh, came out uh, this morning on Straits Times. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, I have friends who help monitor uh, the chatter on uh, Facebook, um, WhatsApp groups and so on. And there are certain new things that we're learning about this group um, in terms of investment. They seek out certain people uh, that will fit the profile uh, and to join the group. It is not open to anyone. They will select and there will be a, a process whether you fit the profile. And I, I think they, they need to look for more members because you must remember this man in his teachings, he's looking for 13 wives. Yeah. And if any one of the wives are financially independent, that, that, that's good, you know. So, Right now, at this stage, it's too late for the husbands. They are divorced and so on, right? The families, uh, they are separated. Uh, there's nothing much you can do. But I know this for sure, that Muiz had actually counseled, the fatwa committee had counseled the man. Uh, this probably was like maybe a year or two ago. and But it doesn't seem, and from uh, what I've heard from people on the ground, that this man is, uh, you know, going to change because he's still doing the same things. He still conducts his late night classes that ends about maybe between midnight and 2 a.m. You know, it's very suspicious when, when the restaurant that they run closes at 8 p.m. at night. And from then onwards, it's like uh, the, his religious teachings, uh, it, it continues till very late. So it's very unusual. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Okay, thank you so much for coming on the show to share more, Zaihan. We've been speaking no to problem. senior correspondent Zaihan Mohammed Yusuf. Now, he has a fascinating exclusive. We've just heard all about it. And you can, of course, read more over at straightstimes.com or in today's paper. An update on the COVID-19 situation here. Eight new cases were confirmed today. All of the new infections were imported cases who were placed on stay-home notice upon arrival in Singapore. There have been no new locally transmitted COVID-19 cases for four straight days. More details will be released tonight. A quick wrap of the local headlines. A locally made kit that detects if someone has antibodies which neutralize COVID-19 has become the first of its kind to receive approval from the US Food and Drug Administration. Known as CPAS, it can be used to see if vaccines work, check what proportion of the population has already been infected, and to assist in contact tracing by enabling the health authorities to retrace the steps of the virus. It does not require highly specialized equipment or training to use and returns results in just an hour. Over 6,300 jobs are on offer in the manufacturing sector, with 1 in 10 from the marine and offshore subsector. In its weekly job situation report, the Manpower Ministry said that these manufacturing job openings have almost doubled since the end of August. Within the sector, electronics, precision engineering and food manufacturing had the greatest number of available openings. For the first time, you can get a chance to see the internal workings of the clock tower at the Victoria Theatre and Concert Hall as it opens its doors to the public. But before you rush to see this 115-year-old structure, the tour is only available to people who sign up for Trafalgar Tours near not far staycation packages. Apart from taking a close up look at the clock and chimes, the approximately two-hour tour also takes in the old parliament building and the Victoria buildings, as well as a peek at what used to be the office for the Speaker of Parliament. In other news, to no surprise, Singapore Airlines is losing money. Its latest results show a record loss of $3.5 billion for the six months to September. The loss was a reversal from a $206 million profit in the same period last year. SIA blaming a plunge in passenger numbers due to the pandemic and impairment charges on older aircraft. Also, the retrenchment exercise which cost 2,000 jobs cost the group $42 million. Ben Srinivasan, The Straits Times' Associate Editor and Executive Editor of Money FM 89.3 joins us now. So Ben, how would you describe SIA's uh, current financial position? When you talk about SIA's financial position, the liquidity matters. Mm. They have raised uh, about $11 billion okay, through uh, the last two months or three months ago. So they are sitting pretty um, in terms of liquidity positions, they are in a better position than most of their Asia-Pacific competitors. Um, they have the money. Uh, but what is more concerning for SIA right now is uh, their competitive position. Um, given that their competitors, although they are distressed, could be headed for hard resets. They're all backed by the governments or sovereign wealth funds in their countries. So the question is, has SIA restructured enough? You know, yes, they have kicked off their second uh, three-year transformation project in uh, October. Uh, they have laid off about 20% of staff. They've done various other things. The question now is, will they come back more competitive? They have the money, whether you'll be competitive enough mm. when it comes down to the crunch. Yeah, right. Now, SIA Group expects uh, it can regain 16% of its pre-COVID capacity by December, as well as 37% of its pre-COVID city links. It's tapping on cargo demand and smaller offerings like you know, the A380 restaurant and the tour of the training facility. But then, to what extent can these strategies help in SIA's overall recovery? Okay, the restaurant A380... Um I went for it, pretty good, well done and all that, mm. yeah. But it is primarily a customer engagement uh, exercise, okay, just to keep SI in the minds and give, give locals and whoever is interested an SI experience. It's not, it's not something to make money. They don't make much money out of that. They did it for two weekends and that was that. 
Cargo helps, yes, but on cargo, they are up against very strong competitors, you know, like the Koreans and the Taiwanese and all that. What SIA really needs is for this 98% passenger loss, traffic loss to come back. And, and, and that's not an easy uh, thing to do given uh, the current position. SIA has no domestic routes. We are a small island. Um, so SIA depends very heavily on markets and routes being reopened. Now we have just uh, Singapore has just negotiated with Hong Kong, and we're going to open a sort of a bubble, you know, where you you do a forty-eight hour pre-departure COVID test and all that. Now, if that works, you know, the Singapore Hong Kong bubble takes off. In fact, I hear tickets have all been sold out. If that works, we can start looking at other markets, whether it's Taipei or Seoul or even Tokyo, uh, maybe even Auckland and others. Well, Van, you've also previously written about how, how SIA will need to become a much smaller company if it wants to ride through the crisis, operating uh, fewer aircraft with a smaller workforce, as well as serving a smaller network and carrying fewer passengers. How is it faring so far on that front, while at the same time maintaining its brand image as a global leader in the aviation industry? They have to be a different airline without giving up their premium branding. Premium branding. Okay? They will still, okay, while I say there will be a smaller airline, it doesn't mean they're going to be a small regional airline. They'll have less aircraft for sure. They may get off routes where there's too much of competition and, and you know, it just doesn't make sense. But they will still be Southeast Asia's uh, biggest intercontinental carrier. I mean, New York, <coughs> Europe, Frankfurt, London, wherever. So SIA will be smaller but it will not be insignificant. It will be, still be a major player. That was Associate Editor for The Straits Times, Van Srinivasan. In global news, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's campaign urged the Trump political appointee who heads the U.S. General Services Administration to approve an official transition of power. This despite President Donald Trump's refusal to concede. The Biden campaign warned that national security and economic interests depended on a clear signal the country would engage in a smooth and peaceful transfer of power. Meanwhile, even before the election, Mr. Biden's healthcare advisors held talks with drug make executives on the Operation Warp Speed program to accelerate development of a possible COVID-19 treatment. According to a Reuters tally, the US became the first nation to surpass 10 million coronavirus infections. It reported about a million cases in the past 10 days, the highest rate of infections since it reported its first case in Washington state 293 days ago. Malaysia begins its extended conditional movement control order today and this has upended plans including public examinations. The sigil of Palajaran Malaysia, which is the equivalent to the O-levels, is normally held at the end of the year, but the Education Ministry has postponed it to February 22nd. Students taking the exam will resume face-to-face -face lessons in school starting January 20th to ensure they receive sufficient preparation before the exams. Well, if you're up for an adventure and looking to explore the more remote spots around the island, our colleagues at the Picture Desk have some suggestions for you. As part of the hashtag GuessWearSG project, the Sunday Times Picture Desk photojournalists went all around Singapore to capture the beautiful scenes of these remote spots. And we ran an Instagram contest, if you remember, two weeks ago, asking our readers where these shots were taken. It was well received, but we eventually narrowed it down to five winners who managed to get all the answers right. The six featured locations include the Raptor Tower in Kranji Marshes, the RAF Changi and HQ FEAF Memorial outside at Changi Village Road, and the Merlion statues in Amokyo Avenue 1. The hashtag GuessWhereSG contest is part of the Straits Times' revamped offering SG GoWhere, which chronicles our colleagues' experiences exploring Singapore. Here to tell us more about the Guess Where SG project is our colleague at the Picture Desk, Deputy Picture Editor Wang Hui Fen. So Hui Fen, these picture, uh, these yeah, these places are after all quite remote. So how did your team find these locations, or were they already on your radar? Um, usually, when we're on assignments, we do like keep track and look out for interesting places. So um, 
my colleagues and I, we have like a lot of places in Singapore that we'd like to share with our readers. Tell us more about the process about making this project work on uh, multimedia, like the 360 degree viewing. Okay, so um, this is a 360 degree camera. It has like 180 and 180 on each side. So with one click, right, I can capture the whole environment, the 360 degree of the place. So this is what I use for the, the project. I see. Was that already in the plan to get a 360 degree view of each location? Or, you know, it did it start off with, you know, just taking a standard shot and then like, hey, I think we should definitely explore a more mm. rounded uh, view of this place. Previously, we usually shoot all these places for like a for print, picture spread. Mm. But now we are trying to engage the audience, trying to offer more interactive content. So we thought, OK, we'll bring the readers to these places that we are taking the shots for the Guest uh, Wear SG contest. Can we expect another series or a continuation of sorts? Um, we are stockpiling places again, so maybe we'll offer a regular uh, column for this. Hey, well, Looking we're forward to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Those are ideas for Olivia to uh, take her children there. Yeah. These places. One is very, very near my house. Ah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Hui Fen. That was Deputy thank you. Picture Editor Wang Hui Fen. Well, for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianta Diman with Olivia Kui. Join us tomorrow for more stories on a big story.